Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 1B. We're going to introduce the properties of DNA, thinking both about DNA as a physical molecule with physical properties and as an informational molecule, how these physical properties allow DNA to be the carrier of genetic information. Now, DNA is both. It's a physical molecule and it's the genetic instructions that are used to build our bodies and the instructions that are passed on to future generations. How does this work? Well, first, DNA is the kind of molecule that's called a polymer. As we said earlier, it's a chain of identical or nearly identical subunits. In DNA's case, as an informational polymer, the subunits need to be different because it's the order of the subunits that creates the information. In DNA, there are four kinds of the subunits called bases, and they go by the names A, G, C, and T. DNA typically has two strands. So it's we talk about it as if it was one molecule, but really the functional DNA in a cell is two molecules wound around each other. We often draw it like this to indicate that. And in these two strands, the bases that are across from each other are physically complementary. They're not identical, but they fit together. And the meaning of that is shown here. So this is just a schematic representation, representation of the four bases as four different shapes attached to a line that represents the DNA strand. And the important feature about these four shapes is that they are pairwise complementary. So the shape of the A base fits with the shape of the T base. The shape of the G base fits with the shape of the C base. But they don't fit in other combinations. If we try to pair an A with a C or a C with a T, either they don't fit or they bump together. Now, this fit is mediated both by complementary shapes and by complementary charges, the mixtures of uh, pluses and minus charges on different parts of the base molecules. Now, these interactions of shapes and charges together create um, a kind of chemical interaction called hydrogen bonding. These are individually weak but collectively strong chemical bonds that serve several very important funct physical functions for DNA. They hold the DNA strands together so they don't come apart. They direct DNA replication so that a new strand can be synthesized using the old strand. And they direct the synthesis of the related molecule called RNA. Now, these sequences, these base pairings, then cr also create the genetic information in the DNA, the order of the bases along the chain, because that's what specifies protein sequences, which are proteins are the workhorses of the cell, and it also specifies other genetic functions. So the two strands have complementary shapes and charges, thus the two The two strands have complementary information as well, the information being the sequence of the bases. Because of this, it's possible to do error correction. If one strand is wrong, the other strand, the bases in the other strand, provide the information to correct the mistakes. This is called informational redundancy. And it's a very important feature of all informational systems, including the computers that I'm recording this on and that you're watching this on. It also allows for copying of the information, duplicating of the genetic information for heredity, and it allows for readout of the information to instruct the cells to produce proteins. Now, here's a drawing of DNA, just a schematic drawing. Um, as I said earlier, the DNA in each chromosome is two very long single strands, and you can follow these in this chemical structure along this backbone of each strand. 
And these bonds that hold the strands together between one one subunit and the next subunit, these are strong bonds. They're not going to come apart at all. In contrast, the bases, and here are the bases, A and T, um, C and G held together. They're held together by hydrogen bonds that, as I said, are weak bonds. So they're fairly easily pulled apart. Individually, they're weak. In the whole molecule, summed up over all the bonds in the molecule, they're very strong holding the DNA together, but it's relatively easy to pry individual bonds apart. This is important because the strands have to separate when the DNA replicates or when the bases are um, transcribed into RNA to direct protein synthesis. One other point I didn't make is that these molecules are asymmetric. So, if you look at it from this side, it's different than if you look at it from this side. Um, it's like, they're like text. So the letters in our alphabet are asymmetric. If you write them backwards, they mean something different. And the text that we read, the text on this screen, for instance, has to be read in a particular direction to make sense. In Western languages, we read from left to right. Um, in the same way, the DNA strands are asymmetric, and they're asymmetric in a particular way. We can think of each strand as having a direction, and we refer to the ends by numbers, 3 prime and 5 prime, and we would put an arrow at the 5 prime end. So the other strand is running in the other direction from its 3 prime end to its 5 prime end. Now, one final feature of the double helix, when the two DNA strands are wound around each other, and that is that even though the bases are interacting with each other in base pairs, the sides of the bases are still exposed on the side of the double helix, like the sides of a rope, so that it's possible just by looking at the sides of the DNA for a protein to sense which bases are present in which order. And the importance of this will be seen in this slide here. So there are two ways that the physical properties of DNA become information. And the one that has to happen first isn't coding for proteins. Instead, it's the ability of specialized DNA binding proteins to feel the shapes of the DNA and bind to particular sequences. And that's illustrated here. Here's a DNA molecule a regulatory protein feeling its way along the DNA until it comes to a place in the DNA where that has the right sequence of bases that it's able to bind to. So that would be these base pairs here. This protein can feel the sequence of the bases even though the DNA is still base paired in its double helix. And the big green arrow here indicates that this protein, having found its appropriate sequence, is going to cause something to happen maybe DNA replication, maybe some other process. Now, the base sequences of other segments code for protein. And the way they do that is that they are undergo processes called transcription and translation into polymers, other polymers, the informational polymer RNA, which we'll describe in the next lecture or the one after, and protein. We'll talk a lot about protein in Module 3. Um, the DNA sequence specifies the sequence of these molecules. This is just a little diagram of the process of transcription, where we have double helical, double-stranded DNA that's come apart. It's unzipped so that this, this protein can make an RNA copy of one strand. So what have we done? We've talked about DNA's physical properties how it's made up of two strands, um, each with a strong backbone, and weak base pairing between them that's highly specific between particular pairs of bases, A with T, G with C, and how the sides of the bases are exposed. These physical properties then make possible the informational properties, that there are sites where regulatory proteins can act, and base pairing allows for accurate DNA replication, and then, as we'll see, allows 
for in specifying the sequences of the proteins that are to be synthesized. Now, coming up next, we're going to take just a few minutes to talk about how we represent DNA, because this is an important issue to get straight before we go on. I hope to see you there.